to our webinar, which is management of constipation by community pharmacists. We are delighted to, have to deliver this webinar. So we hope you will enjoy the presentation that will be uh, discussed by our different uh, speakers. So Ed, we'll, uh, discussing the uh, management of constipation and allow me to introduce myself. I am Marwan Ael and I am an FIP projects manager for workforce development, evidence and impact. Uh, I am delighted to be here to moderate this event. So some uh, like uh, announcements at the beginning of our uh, event. So this webinar is being recorded and live streamed via YouTube. The recording will be available on our website, events.fip.org. You may ask questions using the question box provided. So please, if you have questions, go to the Q&A uh, and, &A, uh, and uh, send us your questions so that we can answer them either during the panel discussion at the end of our meeting or uh, when the speakers will be uh, talking about the presentation. You are welcome to provide feedback to webinars at FIP.org. And if you're not an FIP member, please visit www.fip.org if you wish to become a member, go to membership and then registration and become a member at FIP. So, FIP would like to thank Sanofi uh, Consumer Healthcare for supporting this online event through unrestricted. And for today, next slide, please. So we are having um, three panelists. We're having uh, Dr. Jehan Safwan, which is Assistant Dean at the Lebanese International University. We'll be having Dr. Ahmad Madish, which is, who is Senior Consultant and Head Center of Gastroenterology. And we'll be having also Dr. Jao Rafael Gonzalez, who is a community pharmacist. And they will be tackling the uh, management of constipation from different aspects. So today's program. We will start by his contribution to improving constipation management in the community, presented by Dr. Jehan Safwan. Then we'll go to how helpful are exercise, fiber, and fluids for constipation, presented by Professor Ahmed Madish. And then we will uh, have a third presentation from uh, Dr. Jao Rafael Gonzalez about therapeutic options for constipation and laxatives in community dwelling older adults. We will floor questions and answers at the end, and we'll have our closing remarks to finish our webinar. So our learning objectives, uh, we will try to, uh, by the end of this event, to understand the role of pharmacists in managing constipation in the community, and understand the influence of fiber, exercise, and fluids in constipation management and explore the complication of constipation medicines, especially in older adults. We will start by our first panelist, uh, Dr. Jehan Safwan, which is Assistant Dean. She's Clinical Associate Professor at the Lebanese International University in Beirut, Lebanon. Her presentation will be about pharmacist contribution to improving constipation management in the community. Dr. Jehan Safwan has multiple publications in peer-reviewed journals, and she has attended multiple national and international conferences where she presented multiple accredited lectures and scientific posters. Dr. Jehan, the floor is yours. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Marwan, for your introduction. And I would like to thank the FIP organizers for asking me to speak today. So, the topic that I will be discussing today is constipation and particularly the contribution of pharmacists to improving constipation management in the community. Why constipation? Well, constipation and specifically chronic constipation is a very common condition seen in our practice. Almost every single day, we as pharmacists have the patient coming to our pharmacy or consulting with us on the phone or whenever we're out because they are suffering from some GI disturbance and in many cases or many times it is constipation. So it is a very important topic, but unfortunately it is overlooked. Why? Because it does not entail any urgency. It does not entail any emergency. So tackling this topic by the FIP and within the GI series is really crucial 
and we should thank the FIP for all their efforts in this regard. So regarding my disclosures that are not relevant to this presentation, my learning outcomes by the end of this session, the participants should be able to define constipation, the subtypes, the symptom patterns in brief, to review the diagnosis and prevention also in brief, we will try to explore the treatment options. And the key message for treatment options is that one size does not fit all. As we all know, constipation is a polysymptomatic heterogeneous disorder. So no one treatment will work for everybody. So we have to be prepared for change. And finally, the last and most important part, which is understanding the role of pharmacists in managing constipation in the community. So to start with, what is constipation? When we talk about constipation, the term constipation, it has varied meanings for different people. Every individual has a different definition of constipation. It's not a diagnosis, but it is a symptom uh, uh, constellation because normal elimination patterns for every patient differ or they vary. Stools may be too hard for some, too small for others. Some people, they will say that the defecation is too difficult. So all of those, they cannot be really quantified. But what we can quantify is the frequency of defecation, defecation being infrequent. So this is something that we can quantify. And accordingly, the right definition or the within the definition of constipation, it is defined as a stool frequency of less than three per week. So do we need to defecate every day? Not really. So it is everybody has a normal. And one very important aspect about constipation is the fact that it can be chronic. When we say chronic constipation, it is infrequent bowel movements or difficult passage of stools that persist for several weeks or longer. And this is really, really something that, that, that or this condition will interfere with our ability to go about our daily tasks or with the patient's ability to go with, our, with their daily tasks. And this is why we need to tackle this condition or this disease. So some epidemiology about constipation. In North America, it was reported that chronic constipation affects around 63 million people. Worldwide, the prevalence was estimated from 12 to 19%. Uh, constipation was more frequent in North America and Europe in comparison with Asia. Why? Probably it was related to differences in culture, diet, or environment. Even a meta-analysis of patients in Europe and Oceania showed a prevalence rates of as high as 81% with a general incidence of approximately 17%. Some of the risk factors that were associated with the prevalence of constipation in this meta-analysis included female sex, age, and educational class, which will be presented in our risk factors. So what can contribute to constipation? What are the risk factors? Being an older adult, being a woman, being dehydrated, eating a diet that's low in fiber, getting little or no physical activity, taking certain medications such as sedatives, opioid pain medications, some antidepressants or antihypertensives, or even having a mental health condition such as depression or an eating disorder, all of those, they can contribute to constipation, among others, of course. So let's discuss what are the types of constipation. Everyone attending this webinar, I'm sure that they have suffered from constipation at some point in their time. But we may have occasional constipation that, may be, that is maybe self-limiting. <clears throat> there has been also reports of traveler's constipation. We experienced that multiple times when we travel. And then, so this is one type. Then also it is well known since long time ago that people have talked about fiber deficiency as a cause also of constipation. Is this really the only cause? Is it really fiber deficiency? According to the data, the average American takes about seven grams of fiber a day. So do we usually really, is this enough? If, 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 if that's, in, this is actually not enough. All of us should be constipated, but we're not. So what I'm trying to say is that fiber deficiency is only one component of this really complex illness. And then there is the con chronic constipation. And I would like to break it down into the primary, where the major dysfunction is in the colon or in the anorectal region. We have slow transit constipation. We have dyssynergic defecation. We have irritable bowel syndrome constipation and pelvic floor disorders. And then we have the secondary constipation, which I will talk about in the coming slide. And then although opioid-induced constipation is a type of secondary constipation, but still I have managed to subcategorize it separately because now it is well known uh, that the FDA has indication for treatment uh, for, for this type of constipation by using certain specific drugs that we are going to also discuss in the coming slides. So here's a list of various uh, secondary causes, which most of you are familiar with. 
we have malignancy, colorectal cancer, ovarian cancer. We have mechanical obstruction. We have endocrine disorders, mainly diabetes mellitus is the number one disorder. Neurological dysfunction or disorders, uh, particularly Parkinson's disease. We have metabolic disorders, collagen, vascular and muscle disorders. Mainly we have EDS and pregnancy. Quarter of the patients, they have reported uh, constipation during pregnancy. And last but not least, even though it's in the, 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 the first uh, secondary cause, is medications and including opioids, as we have previously mentioned. So what are the signs and symptoms of chronic constipation? People have reported passing fewer than three stools a week, having lumpy or hard stools, straining to have bowel movements, feeling as though there is a blockage in the rectum, feeling as though you cannot completely empty the stool in the rectum, needing help to empty your rectum, and constipation is, as we mentioned, considered chronic if we've experienced two or more of these symptoms for the last three months. Accordingly, this is where the diagnostic criteria come in. The row four criteria, the most updated ones for functional constipation, they manage to, 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 to explain what, uh, how to diagnose constipation in patients. So the criteria that we are going to discuss below should be fulfilled for at least three months with symptom onset of at least six months prior to the diagnosis. What are we talking about? We need to have two or more of the following during the last, 20, uh, sorry, during at least 25% of defecations, a quarter of the defecations, the patient has reported straining, lumpy or hard stools, according to the Bristol school stool scale, forms one and two, which are seen in the uh, green box. So types one and two, when we have separate hard lumps and lumpy and sausage-like uh, uh, like stools, uh, a sensation of incomplete evacuation, a sensation of anorectal obstruction or blockage, or manual maneuvers to facilitate defecation, such as digital evacuation, and having had less than three spontaneous bowel movements per week. Also, loose stools have been reported by the patients to be rarely present without the use of laxatives and having insufficient criteria for IBS. So as we mentioned, the criteria should be fulfilled for at least three months and the symptom onset with at least six months prior to the diagnosis. And here there's a, a small note that I have here that although patients with functional constipation, they may have abdominal pain and or bloating, but they are not the predominant symptoms. What we're trying to say that here it is when we have the abdominal bloating, it might be due to IBS. Other diagnostic tests that can be done also include a general physical exam, a digital rectal exam, doing some blood tests for hypothyroidism or having high calcium levels, doing an X-ray, sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy, anorectal manometry, balloon expulsion test, colonic transit, scintigraphy, X-ray defecography, MRI defecography. So all of those they are diagnostic tests that are usually done by physicians in order to try to find out what is the reason for the constipation that the patient is presenting with. Some complications of constipation include hemorrhoids, anal fissures, fecal impaction, rectal prolapse. They're not the only complications, but those are some of the complications. So treating constipation is really important. And our role as pharmacists is really important to try to uh, make people aware about the prevention of, of constipation. So here's our first role, prevention. How do we do it? By asking patients to include plenty of high fiber foods in their diet, to eat fewer foods with low amounts of fiber, such as processed food, drinking plenty of fluids. Those are going to be tackled in the coming presentation, in the coming, uh, in the coming uh, presentation by Dr. Ahmed, staying as active as possible, trying to get regular exercise, trying to manage stress, not ignoring the urge to pass tool, trying to create a regular schedule for bowel movements and making sure that children who start eating solid foods, they take plenty of fiber in their diets. What else? So we have also treatment. Treatment for constipation, chronic constipation specifically usually begins with the diet and lifestyle changes. And if those changes don't help, our doctor can may recommend medications or surgery. So to start with, with the non-pharmacological treatment, so very briefly, I'm not going to go into details. So diet and lifestyle changes, increasing, increasing the fiber intake. And along with the fibers, we need to drink plenty of fluids or asking our patients to drink plenty of fluids to help this fibrous material to pass through the digestive tract smoothly. Uh, some products or some food supplements that can uh, include fiber, whole grains, corn, beans, avocado, apples, nuts, a very long list. Exercising most days of the week, not ignoring the urge to have a bowel movement. Why? Because this helps with ins to ensure that you will continue to perceive the important, the usefulness of the signal that you need to go to the toilet. So if we ignore it, our, our bowel might think that this is not a signal that, that is necessary and it will stop it, which might lead to more and more constipation. 
As for the pharmacological treatment, we have laxatives that are available over the counter. Again, I'm not going to go into the details because this is going to be tackled in the, uh, the third presentation. We have fiber supplements, we have stimulants, osmotics, lubricants, stool softeners, enemas and suppositories. Here I included some of the mechanisms of action. You can check them out. Some of the examples like fiber supplements, including psyllium, stimulants such as bisacodyl or senna, supposi uh, senna supplements, osmotics like oral magnesium hydroxide, lubricants like mineral oil, stool softeners such as docuzate, and enemas and suppositories such as tap water enemas and glycerin or bisacodyl suppositories. Uh, the FIP has, uh, has published a book, a handbook for pharmacists, uh, Empowering Self-Care. It's a very nice handbook that I encourage everybody to check it out that, uh, that, that talks about self-care and, 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 and various diseases. And it's, it's a really nice handbook that we as pharmacists can really benefit from. And I have adapted from this handbook, the, this table that includes the laxatives that are available over the counter. It tackles all the GI, but those are the ones for self-care. So it, it mentions the normal dosage, the onset of action, the duration of use, the main adverse effects, and the considerations, where they reinforce the importance of adherence again and again to the dietary and lifestyle measures before starting with any medication or along with any medication to be used for treatment of constipation. As for the prescription medications, so where do they come? If OTC medications don't help, then your doctor will recommend a prescription medication. And we as pharmacists, we need to know about those medications to know why they are being prescribed and how do they work and what to counsel our patient about. We have multiple drug categories. We have the prosecretary agents such as lubiprostone, linaclotide, and plicanatide. We have serotonergic agents such as procalopride, which is a serotonin 4 agonist. And we have the opioid antagonist, which also rings a bell why we mentioned that it is a subcategory by itself as a type of constipation, because we have specific medications that can treat it, such as naloxigol and methylnaltrexone. They are peripherally acting new opioid receptor antagonists. So those are the prescription medications. Some other treatment options. Also, we have training of the pelvic muscles by the biofeedback training. What is this biofeedback training? I'm not sure if you are familiar with this. It involves working with a therapist who uses devices to help the patient learn to relax and tighten the muscles in the pelvis. Why is this important? Because relaxing, relaxing the pelvic floor muscles at the right time during defecation also will help in passing stool more easily. So it will help those patients. What about surgery? So surgery also may be an option. If you have tried other treatments and your chronic constipation is caused by blockage, rectocele, and or stricture, surgery is necessary in this case. Or if patients, they have tried all types of treatments without success, and still they have abnormally slow movement of the stool through the colon, then we can go for surgical removal, removal of part of the colon. Uh, are we, do we do it like an entire colon removal? Not really, it's rarely necessary in patients with constipation, but it is an option. So, the most important part, our pharmacist role. So we mentioned the drugs, we mentioned the prevention. So Patients, usually they consult us as pharmacists for assistance in the gastric and digestive complaints. So it's critical for us as pharmacists to be aware of the different options for preventing and treatment, treating constipation that we have discussed previously. And again, what can we do too? We have some, things, some, some very important roles. Evaluating the patient's medical record. The patient's medical record, it might be time consuming, but it's really important because we might find out that there are certain medications to be the cause, such as narcotic analgesics, like opiates, antacids or, uh, like, like containing aluminum hydroxide or calcium carbonate, calcium channel blockers, diuretics, Parkinson's medications, antispasmodics, antidepressants, drugs that have anticholinergic side effects, iron, calcium supplements, which have a side effect of constipation, anticonvulsants. So if a medication is suspected to be the cause, the patient should be urged to discuss the problem with their prescriber so that they can consider altering the regimen or try to find other medications that have less of this side effect. What else can we do? We need to know the alarming features, the red flags, when to refer our patients to physicians. If a patient is coming and we find out the patient has a serious underlying medical condition such as Parkinson's disease or diabetes, we refer. The patient is a possible laxative abuser or misuser. We're going to discuss this in the coming slide. Constipation has lasted longer than seven days. Patient has a rectal bleeding, sudden change in the bowel habits that last for two weeks or longer. The patient has constipation accompanied by abdominal pain, nausea, or vomiting. Those might be signs of appendicitis. The patient has had an ileostomy, colostomy. 
Patient is pregnant, breastfeeding. The constipation is alternating with diarrhea. It might be IBS. Patient has rectal pain or sharp, severe abdominal pain, especially if it's accompanied also by bloating. Stools are thin or pencil-like. So also we need to check this out. Patient has unexplained weight loss, refer. And if the patient has used a laxative and or instituted lifestyle changes, but remains constipated, also we need to refer our patients to a physician. What else can we do? So laxative abusers, misusers, we mentioned this in the previous slide. What are the types of abuse or misuse? Those are some examples of patients or of, of categories of patients who might be abusing. Individuals who are engaged in certain types of athletic training, including sports with set weight li limits. So they will abuse the laxatives to lose weight so that they can compete or win in a certain tournament, for example, like wrestlers. We have uh, patients who, are, who suffer from eating disorders such as anorexia or bulimia. Those patients, they usually abuse laxatives in the purgative type mostly stimulants that contain bisacodyl or senna to lose weight. How are we going to recognize those patients? So if we see that we have a patient who is thin or drastically underweight, a woman specifically, because most commonly those disorders appear in females, this should trigger an alarm when they are repeatedly purchasing such medications. Also, another type of abuse is surreptitious laxative abusers who use the drugs to cause factitious diarrhea and may have a factitious disorder. So such a disorder, it's a, it's a kind of a, a, a problem. It's, it's, a, it's a psychological disorder. They want to attract attention, so they will do that. They can uh, abuse those laxatives to produce more and more, uh, to, to, to produce loose tools. Patients also who use laxatives over the seven-day limit, they become laxative dependent. They cannot do anything about it. They become abusers slash misusers, so laxative dependent. If we as pharmacists suspect abuse or misuse, the refusal to sell is warranted, and this is very important. What can we do? We can place the laxatives of abuse behind the counter with a sign informing the patients that they must ask the pharmacist for them. This way, we can ask the right questions when they come to ask for those medications. Also, we can check the patient's age. Why is this very important? Because laxatives and fiber products, even though that we say that they are over the counter and they are safe and anybody can use them, yet still we have certain age limits below which they are not safe for self-treatment. Here are some examples. Uh, glycerin suppositories and enemas, polycarbophil, docuzate, magnesium hydroxide, sodium phosphate enemas, mineral oil enemas, magnesium citrate, castor oil, and senna, they are safe to be used in children who are two years and above. Those that are safe for six years and above include methyl cellulose, psyllium, oral mineral oil, and bisacodyl. Carbon dioxide suppositories, not commonly used, but they are usually safe only for those who are 12 years and above, and PEG, polyethylene glycol, PEG3350. It's only safe for people who are more than 17 years, so they should not be used in teenagers or in, 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 in younger kids. Finally, I have uh, managed to gather some literature that is related to pharmacist role in constipation management. What was really um, astonishing to me was the fact that there was not much literature related to the pharmacist role. What I could find are the following articles. One article uh, entitled Impact of Guideline Awareness in Public Pharmacies on Counseling of Patients with Acute or Chronic Constipation. In a survey of pharmacy personnel, it showed that the awareness of guideline on the management of constipation was poor among the pharmacy personnel. Another article entitled OTC, PEG, and Pharmacist Role in Managing Constipation also found out that pharmacists can play an important role in managing constipation with OTC agents. And finally, we have another article that was entitled Evaluation of Constipation Management in the Lebanese Community Pharmacies, and also within from this article, we could find out that the role of the pharmacist in the management of GI problems is specifically constipation is crucial. And identifying patients who are laxative dependent is really important in order to guide them on how to, on counseling them regarding the appropriate use of dietary prophylaxis and the follow-up. So finally, what are my take-home messages? What are the take-home messages for you? So Constipation is caused by many problems, including potentially dangerous medical conditions. So it might be just a symptom and medications that we may be taking may be the reason. So finding out which medications, what medical conditions have, have, have caused this is really important in order to guide our treatment. Telling the patients not to self-treat constipation for more than seven days, guiding them about this, counseling them is very important. There are many precautions on the labels of laxatives that we should read and understand before the use. 
So also counseling our patients about this is very important, asking them to consult the pharmacist for assistance with these products so that they know that even though they are over the counter, still there is a need for counseling because they are they may be not, not they may be not not safe for them. And fine, last but not least, the pharmacist is specifically trained to help everybody or the patients to choose the appropriate products for preventing and relieving constipation. And always remember, if you have any questions, I'm telling the patients, consult your pharmacist. And this is what we should always manage to tell our patients. I would like to thank you for attending. And I will be taking questions, I think, at the end. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful presentation that is comprehensive and that sets the scene for the upcoming ones. We would like now to welcome uh, Professor uh, Ahmed Madish. He's a specialist in internal medicine and gastroenterology. For 12 years, he's the chief physician of clinic for gastroenterology. And since 2021, he's the senior consultant and head in one of the largest gastroenterological practice sites clinics in Frankfurt, Germany. His scientific focus includes, among other functional GI disorders, inflammatory bowel disease and gastroesophageal reflux disease. Professor Ahmed has authored and co-authored several national treatment guidelines for chronic constipation, irritable bowel syndrome, diverticulitis, helicobacter pylori, and other uh, disorders like uh, reflux disease. Uh, Professor Ahmed, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Marwan, for the kind introduction. Dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, to present here. It's a great honor uh, during this FIP digital event. And after a very excellent introduction of management of constipation, um, I want to focus now on our general um, recommendation in patients with chronic uh, constipation. And I want to answer the question, what, what is the evidence uh, for our recommendation and uh, um, what can we do besides this? I want to start, can I have uh, the control? Yes. Um, I want to start with the algorithm. Um, we fix it in our uh, uh, newly updated guideline of, of, of uh, obstipation, of chronic obstipation. It's in German, of course, I want to, uh, I don't want to go in detail, uh, but I want to um, emphasize that the first step um, of patient with chronic constipation is the diagnostic workup. I think this is uh, very necessary in patients with chronic constipation. Why it's necessary? Of course, we want, regardless of the red flags, we want to exclude, uh, exclude uh, serious diseases. And this reassurance for the patient that there's no serious uh, uh, disease, I think it's a very important uh, part of the uh, management of patients with uh, uh, chronic constipation. And of course, uh, at the bottom, the next step um, is the general uh, recommendation for all patients, uh, um, increasing the intake of fiber, uh, increasing the fluid intake and increasing the physical activity. And now the question is, what is the evidence? Uh, is there any effect of this recommendation um, in our patients with chronic uh, obstipation? And there are a lot of myths and uh, possibilities that patients uh, often think that they are um, responsible for, for the problem of uh, um, constipation. Mm -hmm. They think they should do more sports, should uh, eat healthier diet or should drink more water. And I think uh, we have to explain the patient that this is not the problem in most of the patient. Uh, um, there are other factors we hear uh, in the introduction and talk uh, before. Because um, when we compared constipated and healthy people, um, we didn't see any um, of difference uh, uh, of these uh, factors. That means that uh, necessarily uh, uh, lead to constipation or to a significant improvement in the symptoms after they have been resolved. I think this is very important to know. Um, I show you some uh, uh, evidence that uh, in healthy uh, people, if you uh, 
uh, increase the uh, physical activity, it's of course possible to uh, um, uh, decrease the transit time. Uh, and on the other hand, if you increase the uh, rest phase, uh, for example, bed rest phase, um, the uh, number of bowel movements uh, will be reduced. But this is in healthy subject. Um, and if we um, increase the physical activity um, in uh, constipated uh, patients, there are some data uh, you see on the left side that if you add on the physical activity, uh, uh, add on to dietary advice, it is uh, uh, possible to uh, reduce constipation symptoms. But on the left side, you see another study that shows if you uh, increase exercise period uh, uh, by increasing the walking distance, um, there will be no difference uh, regarding uh, uh, the constipation index. That means that um, the evidence uh, increasing phys uh, physical activity is very weak. The next, that mean that the data uh, are ambitious and uh, increasing uh, the physical activity has no really a substantial effect in patients with chronic obstipation. Of course, we recommend nevertheless that physical act inactivity should be avoided, and um, but a therapeutic effect of any physical activity uh, going beyond the normal age appropriate level should not be uh, promised by uh, for the patient. What about the fiber? I think uh, there are uh, good data, um, and the mechanism of action is uh, well studied. That if you uh, increase the fiber, you increase the bacterial mass and uh, uh, over binding, uh, it's, it's binding uh, uh, water and uh, both uh, is possible to, to increase the peristaltic um, of the colon. And um, it's very important that the short chain fatty acids also play an important role when increasing the peristaltic effect of the colon. And there are, of course, meta-analysis and uh, multiple studies that shows if you significantly, uh, if you, if you uh, increase the fiber intake, you can increase significantly the stool frequency and the stool consistency uh, when compared to placebo. But the problem of uh, increasing fiber is that uh, increasing fiber makes uh, flatulence and meteorism in many of patients and that makes it a little bit uh, uh, difficult uh, um, uh, for the patient and the most of the patient uh, uh, stop uh, um, the, the treating with a fiber. We have to keep this uh, um, in mind. That means in our um, um, uh, guideline, we of course um, recommend to increase the fiber up to uh, 30 gram per day um, and it can help with mild constipation but um, in a, a patient with a slow transit obstipation it's about 20 to 30 percent have a slow transit obstipation uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, it can increase the problems why because you you increase the bacterial mass and the peristaltic is slow and uh, patient become more problems than before that we have to keep in mind and uh, uh, a lot of people uh, often complain about bloating. What about um, fluid intake matter? I think we recommend this to uh, normalize uh, the drink, uh, uh, the fluid intake up to two liter per day, uh, but uh, an increase in fluid intake above this uh, recommend a daily amount has not any uh, has not uh, or does not have uh, a positive effect on a patient with constipation. And it was mentioned in the talk before that the uh, uh, toilet advice is very important. The optimal pushes is uh, very important, and uh, it's important not to suppress the urge to go. Uh, uh, and we have. Um, 
um, uh, leverage of, uh, uh, of the natural bowel rhythm that in the morning and after food intake, there's a natural rise in the bowel activity and we should uh, uh, use this. And of course, don't suppress uh, uh, the urge uh, to go. Um, this is uh, again the algorithm and we um, recommend at the uh, bottom um, of the algorithm, but we know that in most patients uh, with chronic constipation, um, we are not able to control the symptoms by these general recommendation. We need laxatives also chronically uh, with chronically intake to control the symptoms in about 80% of patients. And I think in the next uh, uh, talk, we will hear uh, uh, a lot uh, about laxatives, but uh, uh, it's important for me to emphasize that we re recommend these general, uh, uh, um, like uh, increasing fluid intake, fiber and physical activity, but in the really constipated patients, it's not enough and we need the next steps in the algorithm. Thank you very much for the attention and uh, I looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. And uh, we do know that you gave us your time for this presentation, but we know that after like a few minutes, you would be like in the, uh, in the clinics having to see some patients. So before uh, going to our third presentation, we have a few questions in the Q&A uh, box that we would like to have your input on them. And then we would be asking the other presenters at the end of the presentation for other questions or if they have input about any of these questions. So first of all, we had like um, a, a coming question about the, how do we manage constipation for children? So we have it like it came from uh, two of the participants uh, about uh, constipation and pediatrics. And then we have also a question asking if there is a genetic predisposition to have chronic constipation. So we would like I to think, have your input on those questions. Yeah, first, first, of, first of all, in all diseases, there is uh, a genetical part of, uh, uh, um, uh, of, of, of a disease. But um, um, I think that's new uh, in, in different studies. And of course, um, and what, what about uh, uh, constipation managed in children? I'm not a pediatrist, uh, but uh, I think uh, it's, it's no problem with some laxatives uh, um, if, if children take this. Um, I think this is uh, very safe uh, in the treatment. And we, we hear uh, uh, before um, that there are uh, um, uh, age restrictions, but I think in... Uh, a doctor can uh, uh, treat children with this. It's no problem. Thank you, thank you. And as you've said, uh, we, ha we have seen in the previous presentation that some laxatives may be used uh, for pediatrics, but it depends on the age and which laxatives to be used. Uh, yeah. Thank you a lot, Dr. Ahmed, for your presentation and uh, um, for, for being with us. And please feel free to, uh, to leave uh, the session whenever uh, you want. We know that you, you, should have, you should be in the clinics. We're again thankful for your uh, uh, presentation and we will go now to our third speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our third speaker is Jao Rafael Gonzalez. Jao is a community pharmacist in Portugal. He will be talking about therapeutic options for constipation and laxative in community dwelling older adults. Jao has a NEM farm, is a community pharmacist and is a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Pharmacy at the University of Lisbon. Uh, he's a researcher uh, at the IMEDU Lisboa Research Institute for Medicine in the field of long-term care with special interest in medicine use in geriatric population. Jao, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marwan, for your introduction. And thank you, everyone, to those who are watching us all across the world. It's, it's good to, to have so many colleagues. And of course, um, thanks to our um, my colleagues from this panel, uh, you made a brilliant presentation, which is really helpful uh, for me as a community pharmacist and to, to complement my presentation. 
Yeah, so this is the title of my presentation. So the main core of my presentation is laxatives in older adults. And before we dive into um, the agenda for today, I would like just to clarify some, some things. I will be referring to, to older adults and those who can live by themselves or in communities, but mostly those who can who are able to visit uh, community pharmacies and uh, be assisted by us, community pharmacists. I have nothing to, de to declare regarding any conflict of interest. And as my main objective for, for today is to bring to you, of course, guidelines and we as pharmacists, we are scientists from the very beginning, well, first of all. So my point here is to bring to you science and to merge it to, to make a fusion between the real world data and evidence through my practice and my colleagues' practice. And of course, we have this limitation because I work in Portugal, but I think that many of our experiences can be uh, shared and can be adapted uh, all over the world. So this is my, my main goal. So for today, I divided my, um, my presentation into three main sections. First of all, a, a brief overview of my professional experience and my colleagues' uh, experience. Uh, then on the second section, I'll be addressing, I'll be sharing to you my practical uh, roadmap and some tips that uh, are useful, I think at least are useful for me and my patients um, as a community pharmacist. And if you have time to wrap up, I would like to bring to you a clinical case, a recent clinical case from a, a few months ago. So when I was preparing this presentation, I was looking uh, at my my patients and I was thinking about some, some cases. And it's uh, really interesting to, to find that we have a perfect match between the statistics, uh, I mean, the prevalence of constipation and uh, our experience as community pharmacists. So definitely we have more women uh, complaining about constipation. We have children too, it's not the, the, the target population for today, but it's interesting to, to see that there is uh, this similar for these two similar uh, special populations, they share uh, similar prevalence of constipation and, of course, the elderly. Um, it's interesting. It's uh, noteworthy to 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 look at the inpatient inpatient settings, um, hospital and nursing homes. Not only because it's my field of study as a researcher, but especially because when I work as a community pharmacy, as a community pharmacist. I have many, many patients or carers coming to the pharmacy after an admission in a hospital, after staying in a nursing home and complaining about constipation. So in the transition of care with the community pharmacist, we can play a role, um, an helpful, can be helpful to our patients too. Um, we should uh, raise awareness um, amongst our patients that it's not normal to evacuate just one or twice per week. Some, some patients, the older, patients, they take it as normal. Uh, it is normal. It is not. Um, so we have to, to do these educational interventions towards uh, this uh, population. Um, at the same time, it's um, being a community pharmacist is quite, quite challenging, especially during COVID time, because we have to balance uh, between the work overload, the long queues, and all the symptoms, all the diseases, all the syndromes, all the complaints that that people bring to us. So webinars like these are really helpful, I think, because we have to map, we have to systematize in our heads, in our minds, um, not only for constipation, but for other syn syndromes and symptoms. We have to be efficient in analyzing our patient. At the same time, we have to be, I wouldn't say quick, but we have to be efficient too in managing all the atmosphere in the pharmacy. Um, in general, patients don't get embarrassed uh, when they are describing their symptoms, not only constipation, but in general, because they trust, they trust us. But you have to make sure, so make your patients comfortable uh, so they can share with you all the details. Just the next slide is just something from this last Saturday. I was working during this weekend. I had two patients, uh, one female and one male different ages and different approaches uh, towards constipation. So on your left, you have a female around 50. She works abroad. She comes to Portugal every weekend. And during the business days, 
she doesn't uh, have any bowel movement. So I decided to use two uh, laxatives and, and the bulk forming uh, based on seeds uh, laxative. On your right, you have a different uh, case. So it's an older man. And in this case, I used uh, the statement uh, start low and go slow. So I just used one laxative because all the symptoms, all the description wasn't that um, severe as on your left. So this, is a, this was the profession overview. So this is the core of my presentation, the practical roadmap, and I would say more important, some tips. First of all, you have to collect data. Without collecting data properly, you are not able to make a decision or to refer your patient to, the, to see the physician, for instance. And I would start for this, collecting data. I divided into three other, this is my, mem my mental map, as I told you. Um, I divide into three other sections, this collection, um, this collecting data moment. Characterize, identify, and decide. Uh, on your right, you have uh, uh, the Bristol uh, uh, stool scale. It's really important because you have to ask your patient, you have absence of movements, is it incomplete? Do you have any other condition or symptoms like bloating, is it painful, loss of appetite is really common. And on your right, you have this picture and type one and type two, uh, they can indicate that your patient maybe or probably is dehydrated, is not having a, a proper intake of fiber. So we have to merge these, these data, these guidelines, and to make open questions to your, to your patient. And once again, he, has to, he she has to be uh, comfortable to describe uh, like, like this. Then we have to identify, and identify, I mean, identify causes. There is many, many causes. Sometimes it's idiopathic. We cannot just identify any cause, but it's important not only for your decision making, but it could be important for the physician. So you can send this information to the physician uh, so he, he, she can make a decision or go a bit deeper and look further. It's we as pharmacists, sometimes we look and other times you don't look at medicines or the side effects of medicines. Um, as, uh, as was told in the first presentation, the opioids, uh, they, can, they, they are a common cause for obstipation, but other medicines like antidepressants, irons, and all of those are um, really used by our uh, elderly, but special and on anticholinergic, I would say that we can make a, a difference because there is many, many uh, anticholinergic burden scales. So you can calculate, you can measure the, the, the anticholinergic burden of your patient. And so you can make, you can propose to the physician some uh, deep prescribing. And with these, uh, you, can, um, you can change the OPSI patient uh, um, history. And then you have to decide. If you're not able to decide because there is any uh, red flag like vomiting, bleeding, then of course your patient has to go to the physician. Then you have therapeutic decision. Um, when I do it, I look at four uh, main indicators. Assessment, is it chronic? Is it temporary? What kind of laxatives do I have available? Not only because of shortage, there is many times shortage of medicines, but also because community pharmacy is quite different all over the world. So you have to look at your medicine, the one you have uh, at home in your pharmacy or the medical devices. Your patient's preferences is really important, special for rectal roots, for instance, and you have to avoid impactations or obstruction at any, um, at any cost. Um, from my experience, the three first classes of um, uh, laxatives, the bulk forming, the osmotic, and the stimulants are the most used and more frequently used. The last two, the lubricants and the surface active agents, and not that used, I would say that the surface uh, active agents are more used um, before uh, colonoscopy, for instance. So I made this table. Um, don't take it as a guideline. Of course, it's not the guideline. I was trying to describe to you that my approach and my colleague's approach uh, in um, managing constipation, it depends. It depends on the symptoms for how many days your patient uh, has no uh, bowel movements. Uh, of course, we have to, if possible, to start low and go slow, 
But for many, many patients and to avoid impactation or obstruction, we have to be uh, more intense, but avoiding pain, of course, um, when deciding the therapeutical um, scheme decision. So the bulk forming it's in, in between brackets. I will address it in the next, in the next slide and I will explain why. But first of all, I would like to say that macro goal as it's an osmotic uh, laxity, compared with lactulose, for instance, uh, in, for my experience is better because it reduces the gas production. And many, many times the problem we have is we would like to, the patient to, to have like an oral laxity, like micro goal, lactulose, something around this or belonging to this group. And at the same time to avoid a painful evacuation, to use uh, an enema, for instance, or suppository. But many times our patients, they don't, they don't want to use the suppository or the enema. Um, that's why you have to address the patient's uh, preferences too and to take it uh, in account. But the big message here is to combine, if possible, different classes of laxatives. And from my experience, it works and your patient gets, gets better without uh, side effects and without being that painful. So, when are doing the theoretical decision, still, of course, the, the bulk forming at the first line. Of course, we have to keep uh, saying this to our patients that, okay, you need to, to um, increase the intake of fiber through a medicine, like seeds, or uh, through diet. But the problem is that our older adults, they have a reduced intake of water because the, the sense of thirsty reduces with aging, so it's normal. And that's a problem with sometimes with uh, bulk forming. We as community pharmacists, we have to, to teach how to use properly uh, an enema, left side, squeeze till the end. There is many um, flow charts describing this, so you can show to your patient just to make sure that he's doing it properly. We have to, when addressing, when treating um, the constipation, we should try to skip the daily uh, intake of medicines because our patients, they have, are low, high blood pressure, prostate problems, so they have polypharmacy. And many times we are dealing with treating um, constipation and they are taking the pills at the same time so you can have a, a, lot, a, a loss of efficacy. So it's the typical ADME. So we as pharmacists we have to take this in, in account. Um, and of course, you have to manage all the symptoms. Pain is common, uh, so we have to use softeners and emollients and increase water, so to make the evacuation as painless as, as possible. Flatlands and smelling, you have some mitochon and charcoal, and of course, probiotics and uh, prebiotics. There is no guideline, there is no um, uh, strong recommendation on the use of probiotics and prebiotics, but for some patients, uh, it works. Then we have to follow up, uh, if possible. But you, we as community pharmacists, we have this really close contact with your patients. So it's, it's for many cases, it's possible to, to follow up our patients. And we should label every medication package because your patient had this crisis this month and within three months, you can have uh, another, another crisis, crisis of um, constipation. And he, he, she will, they will have this package of the laxity and the powder and the capsules amongst all the rest of the medicines they take. So it's a big mess. So label everything with indication of pathology. And of course, we have to prevent. We have to teach our patients health management strategies, special diet, changing lifestyle through diets and physical activity. We have to make sure that your patient can increase the intake of water. Like for some patients like cardiac insufficiency, we have to avoid. Or on the other hand, some patients take it too serious. Let's say I was talking with a, with a carer, a daughter of a patient of mine. She's this lady, she's 70 something and she's taking linoclotide and she takes four liters of water a day. Of course, all the yonogram, the sodium was uh, unbalanced because she takes four liters a day. And there we have other patients that taking just two. So we have to... Um, tailor our intervention towards the patient you have in front of you, uh, like patients on warfarin, for instance, so all the, the, um, the foods, all the food rich in vitamin K, K you have to be careful uh, with that. Uh, 
Well, and to wrap up, I think I have time. I won't tell me. Um, I'd like you to bring this clinical case. It was a, car a carrot who came to the pharmacy saying that uh, his daughter, his um, father, um, was suffering from constipation for the last five days. So absence, full absence of uh, bowel movement. He's on uh, chemotherapy and he was taking morphine. Pain control was, um, pain was controlled before the onset of the symptoms. So my first option was to take, or was for him to take lactulose. I had no microgol, for instance, and to use suppositories of glycerin. But I asked her, okay, call your dad, uh, ask him if he trusts on his, if he uh, accepts uh, this, um, this scheme. He said no to the, to the suppositories. So I changed, I gave him lactulose and bisacodyl. And the day after, she came, the, the, the carer came to the pharmacy saying, okay, everything is okay. Bowel movements are back, pain control. So morphine is, is now being absorbed. And of course I told her from now on, maybe probably your dad will need um, a laxity from time to time because definitely he had uh, opioids constipation and this constipation was um, injuring the absorption of morphine. So this is our work as community pharmacists. Thank you for your attention and feel free to, to ask anything you want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for the, uh, this really interesting uh, presentation. And thank you for the clinical case that you, you, you've uh, like presented at the end. And um, uh, allow me to relate this uh, to a question that we have on the Q&A box. At asking about a patient, if the patient is hospitalized after how many days we, uh, we would interfere. So this relates uh, mainly to, to the, the case you have uh, uh, presented. Do you have any, uh, anything to add for this question or um, to, uh, to, to answer it? So you are if referring an adult, to this, if an adult patient is, oh, okay, because it exactly. would be a relevant problem, okay. Well, we have to cross, from my experience, and taking now, not talking just as committee pharmacist, but as a researcher. So I talk with many colleagues from long term care facilities, hospital from pharmacy. I look at many um, medication charts of many uh, patients. The problem goes with the symptoms. If the symptoms are too severe, and after seven days, uh, in that case, maybe you will need, the patient will need something. Uh, more intense because uh, you can take laxatives orally and to end use the enema, for instance, but the volume of feces are so big that doing the evacuation will be really painful and will bloat. So in that case, after seven days, just go to the ER, to the emergency uh, department. It's the best option. Before that, it's like seven days till six days, five days, we can manage, can be a painful the evacuation, um, but it's manageable. After seven days, one week, it's too much, special for uh, all the adults, all the muscles, are, all the, the abdomen muscles are weak. So everything is different when you're uh, aged. That's it, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And uh, we're so happy that uh, we have a good interaction, be it on the chat box or the Q&A. So questions coming, questions being answered. We're, uh, we're delighted that you're enjoying our webinar and the information that is there. I would go now to Jihan and ask her about the caffeine intake and how it affects constipation as she has like um, uh, expressed her willing to answer this question. Yes, so regarding the caffeine, caffeine is a stimulant. It can cause uh, a bowel movement, so it can help. But on the other hand, also caffeine can cause dehydration. So this dehydration can have the opposite effect and might lead to constipation. So we have to be careful about using caffeine. Excessive caffeine might be dehydrating, so it's not recommended. So if you are constipated, avoid, avoid caffeine in general or choose something decaf, uh, um, any kind of drink that is decaf, it would be better. But as caffeine by itself being a stimulant, it will help in inducing a bowel movement. So the, 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 the key message here is about dehydration. So be careful about this. Great, thank you. Zhao, any addition to, to this about caffeine from your experience? Uh, it's true, yeah. I, I wouldn't add anything. It's like 
sometimes you have Thank to look you. at some some lifestyle uh, habits that people have that may trigger so we have to adapt your um your scheme your decision uh, your advice according to what patients say because for many patients it's opposite like uh, having calf, uh, cough is the opposite for others i mean opposite having diarrhea and for other cases they have um, constipation so we have all the time to, to collect data properly and then make yeah. a decision and uh, another question is coming is about the fissures that may be caused by the constipation so yeah. how fissures can be avoided and uh, uh, what would you like to discuss on this matter Zhao? Uh, first of all non-pharmacological measures i think it was uh Hian that uh, show has the picture of um how to uh, for toileting uh, it's really important because especially with cell phones people spend many many hours um in the bathroom it. so yeah. gravity makes makes his, his work all our muscles and then it's funny because funny or interesting that many of our patients that go to the pharmacy with constipation they have an underlying condition like hemorrhoids or uh, fissure so we have to treat everything together like the fissure is really painful or hemorrhoids and you have to to understand whether it's fissure or hemorrhoids and at the same time you have to to treat the constipation. So it's really common. I, I usually say that we, with the older uh, patients, it's like a bit like the, the kids. Many kids, they have constipation because they feel pain, uh, because they have a fissure. They have not hemorrhoids, but a fissure sometimes, or some parasites. Uh, and so they avoid this kid going to the toilet. And it's a bit, it's the same sometimes with uh, older adults. So kids and older adults, I'm not patronizing, but sometimes, they, they, they do not share um, these symptoms and they get constipated because they have, they have pain. Yeah. And I would like to add something also regarding the anal fissures. And from my experience with patients who have had this, uh, they, they, in addition to the, to the, to the non-pharmacological treatment, which is very important, in many cases, they take like chronically uh, fiber supplements uh, to induce uh, or even uh, stool softeners in order to have softened stools because every time they go into the toilet, the fissure is going to be, the, the, the stools are going to affect it. It and will it, relapse, yeah. Yes, it will relapse. So chronic use of, of, of the laxatives will be necessary in many, in many cases. Mm -hmm. They are lucky it will heal, but uh, in many cases they are not lucky. So it's, 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 it's a, it's a very complex situation for, for such patients. And as you said, also in older adults, it becomes, it becomes worse. Or in some patients who will stop going to the toilet, also it will make it worse and worse. That's true. That's true. So, talking about the chronic use of laxatives, we have a question uh, about the overuse or constant use of laxative that may lead to dependence. So um, mm -hmm. can, we, can we discuss this question and explain it uh, to our uh, uh, participants, uh, Jihan would like to start or Zhao. So both of you, please uh, present, uh, discuss this. So basically regarding the laxative dependence or laxative abuse, uh, the, the overuse of fibers, for example, it will not lead to the uh, uh, to, to abuse, but using uh, laxatives such as the, the, the stimulant ones, such as bisabodin mm -hmm. or senna, yes, we, we, we see it and it's very common. And I mentioned it in the in the laxative abuse, uh, uh, in the, in the abuse not the laxative, in the, in the, in the misusers, the abusers of laxatives that we should target or that we should realize when patients come to our pharmacy because such such medications they can cause a lazy colon or a laxative colon. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they will lose the, the, the their colon will lose the ability to stimulate the passage of stools and eventually they will become dependent. So we see it more commonly with stimulants. Those are the most common medications that cause it. Yeah, it's true. The, our older patients, it's 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 it, from my experience, they they prefer to use um, enemas and suppository, for instance, which is better. But at the same time, they prefer to use um, um, herbal medicines like sina, and it's sometimes it's hard to make them change to a macrogol to a lactulose. Oh, this is the best. I take it for twenty years. Okay, it's. It's better in a certain way because it's not a liquid, it's just a pill. You take one or twice or two, 
bad time, but after 20 years with aging, your uh, bowel movements get slower and all your gut is, is changing. So sometimes you have this problem in changing. So we have to go step by step. Okay, just take one and add 15 milliliters of lactulose or add uh, a sachet of macro gold. And after one year, two years, okay, now it's okay. Because sometimes you have to convince your patients that is better. Because otherwise, yeah. I say no. no it, this this pharmacist he just he wants us to change to sell these. No, it's it's not about that. It's, you know, you have to take take on board these kind of uh, preferences. Otherwise, the compliance will be um, will not be that that good. Yeah, yeah. So um, we have a question about the how long it takes to a distended colon to return to normal after chronic constipation. So uh, is this uh, patient dependent or do we, we have like uh, some time frame that we can say between this number of days and, and other? I think it varies a lot. So it's like, yeah. yeah, it varies a lot. There, there, is, there is nothing in the literature that tells us or even in and the guidelines that tells us how long does it take for uh, Colin to get back to normal. In some cases, it happens in a month and others in a couple of weeks. It depends on the patient and it depends on how much they can adopt the non-pharmacological management. Mm -hmm. It depends on the reason for the, the, the cause of the constipation in this patient. Uh, like if, if they have diabetes, it's, it's, they, they, they will adapt, but eventually it will be there kind of, you know? So, so, so it, it really varies. There, there is really no number or no amount of days that we can rely on, or we can say that this is the amount of days that will help mm -hmm. uh, uh, that the patient's colon will be will come back to normal and many times it gets a chronic condition so patient from time to time every i would say like twice per year let's say have this after all the days because many patients when they change like they go on, on all the days after christmas easter um for christian uh, population of course um they have these changes, so they get obstipated, but in advance, they start taking some medicines. It's really important for the patient to self-manage to uh, in advance of some, some occasions. Thank you. Uh, two other questions about the best treatment for pregnancy. So constipation treatment and pregnancy. So uh, uh, your input on this. Stool softeners mm -hmm. are, are, are safe in pregnancy, fiber, those are the most ones being prescribed by the by gynecologists, let's say, for, for pregnant patients who suffer from constipation. So bulk forming and stool softeners. Of course, they have to start with the non-pharmacologic. This is this is the most important and hydration. But otherwise, if they need medications, those have been really safe for pregnant because they're not absorbed. So they work locally on the GI and they are not going to produce any side effects or teratogenicity. That's true. And I agree, definitely. That's why I avoid most of the time some contact laxatives uh, because the, the nutrient absorption can be uh, injured. It's more painful for most of the patients. Sometimes you have to, to use it, but all the time with an osmotic, I think. An osmotic laxative, it's really it's safe and change routes like oral and rectal routes is really important and sometimes just with uh, anema the, uh, it works for the pregnant uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if i can add one thing but regarding the osmotics uh, they, they have to also be careful when to use it because when they are like close to 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 delivery they're not so because it might induce contractions so like within the third trimester they have to try to avoid it it's true because all the, the anatomy is changed. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, like, yeah, it's, like, it's a good tip. It's, this kind of tips are really important. Uh, that's why the rectal roots are better because you have this distal portion of your gut. So it's, but sometimes you don't get the full evacuation. So you need to, to use an oral uh, laxative, but first start with the NEMA, for instance. Yeah. Uh, and then had like four hours later, something like that, or bedtime, add um, an oral laxative. So again, we, we're having a, a case about a two-year-old uh, patient having like chronic uh, constipation, saying more than twice a week. So uh, diet was adjusted, the baby formulas were also uh, adjusted, but um, the participant is asking about what would you recommend for long-term therapy? So... Um, it's something really, it's really common in, in pharmacy, uh, 
with during these ages, uh, kids are experimenting many different foods. We are introducing, presenting to the kids different foods, and sometimes constipation is related with these. We have to rule out the physician. Physician has to rule out any other conditions. It's not as the pharmacist. Um, but that's it. After so many, the formula usually it's the it's the the key to solve the, the problem, and one or other um, food. But with two years, you can have many many different foods. Everything I would say. Um, but we have to to rule out other other things. Um, and, and that's it. With this information, that's it. We can we can say it's for me. For this question for pediatrics, we, we we've got like too many questions about the this uh, category yeah, of people with pediatrics. So maybe also yeah. a good, we yes a good a good idea to to think about a a webinar for uh, pediatric uh, GI conditions. Um, we have also another question coming uh, from like uh, talking about hemorrhoids and anxiety and how, uh, how to manage the anxiety of uh, the patients that are coming to us uh, having constipation, having hemorrhoids, and they're anxious about it. So it's basically the hemorrhoids in this case, as far as I can see, probably they are due to the constipation or even if they have hemorrhoids due to diarrhea because it can happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they're avoiding multiple toileting, how to manage the anxiety and any relation to anxiety and constipation in general, probably I'm not really sure what, what they mean by this, but constipation can cause anxiety. Hemorrhoids will cause the anxiety. They have to go for it. treatment options for the hemorrhoids. There are multiple treatment options available, including the use of uh, of, uh, of corticosteroids locally, mm -hmm. locally being inserted in the rectum along with uh, anesthetics. And of course, as we mentioned, uh, like in the anal fissures also, they, we need to soften the stools. So maybe if this is done, it will help in and decreasing the, 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 the pain induced by, by those hemorrhoids. But of course, if the constipation is there, they need to also treat it because as long as there is constipation, the hemorrhoids are going to, 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 to relapse and they will cause the pain again and again. So it's a, it's, 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 it's a, pro, it's, it's a, it's a vicious cycle that uh, and many, many patients, they suffer from this and it's really a problem. So um, they, as we have mentioned, yeah, the, the treatment for constipation that should, they should adopt including the use of softeners, the, what, whatever is necessary to be and done. To change the diet, yeah. Yes, exactly. And sometimes we'll have too much, too much potato and, and breads, so the stools get hard. So sometimes you just change these instead of, instead of making a soup with, um, let's say, pumpkin and potato, take it out and use spinach and cabbage. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do the same with the kids. Like a kid with, yes. with constipation, just changes the soup and change the formula. With with the adults, is the same. So change these, um, change these habits. So again, questions coming for like constipation for five to six days. What is the emergency? We've already uh, discussed this. Of course, non pharmacological, and then uh, before before going to any emergency uh, plan. Another question is about patient having strictures, constipated and what should be done in order to help this patient. So uh, pain is there. So um, um, I guess it all goes to the, what you have been saying about well, we, like softeners. What, like, yes, softener, but when we have a stricture, they should be evaluated by a physician, for, by a GI mm -hmm. physician to check if there's a need for a surgery because right. having strictures is an indication for surgery. So once done, it might help, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's, so, a, it's a minor, it's a minor syndrome, but it can be really pain, painful. And sometimes people just they keep postponing going to the GI um, um, physician, gastroenterologist, or the, or the, the GP. Uh, and sometimes you just need the surgery. They keep postponing the surgery because they hear the neighbor saying, "Okay, it's really painful. Uh, it doesn't, it didn't work." You know. And we as pharmacists, we have to also say, just go to the physician. Don't yeah. listen to your neighbor saying it's really painful. It didn't work to my cousin. 
And this kind of stuff, otherwise people just coming to the pharmacy, asking for the same, same pills, same powders, same enemas. And sometimes they need something else. They need a surgical intervention or other sort of intervention. So we have to work in collaboration with other professionals uh, and forcing our patients to go to the, to the physician because they trust on us uh, as community pharmacists. But there is nothing more that we can do when they have a fissure that is not healing, hemorrhoids. So what's the point? That's, yeah. that's bad practice. Yes, and the, the, the issue also about uh, postponing the, the uh, taking an appointment is because whenever there is a stricture, there is a need to do a digital rectal exam. So many patients, they just... That's right. That's just right. thinking about it, they, 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 they would think of not going. But we have to tell them that and, and, re, and to, 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 to make them comfortable about it, that they will not feel any pain. It's a, it's a normal procedure that is done. They can use anesthesia so that they don't feel the pain. Whatever is necessary to be done to 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 make them feel comfortable about it. It's true. It's true. It's true. Jao and Jihan, and also allow me to thank Dr. Ahmed for the presentation. So it's the topic, but also it's the presenters. You all participants took questions and to make it, they were really involved with us. So would like to thank you all. And thank you for addressing all the questions. This was really a wonderful. We 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 can see the all the reactions that we're having. So thank you, thank you for all the uh, the participants. We have like just few announcements at the end for some upcoming events at FIP, and then we'll give the floor if you have any uh, final uh, final thing you want to share with the uh, participants. We're having uh, at FIP, the FIP Pharmacy Practice Research Special Interest Group Summer Meeting, which will be held on July 4 and 5 uh, at uh, Utrecht University in, of Applied Sciences in Utrecht in Netherlands. All PhD students, their supervisors, academics, researchers, and professional organizations and practitioners that are involved in research are welcome to join the meeting. During this meeting, you will a global network uh, pharmacy work to present uh, your research by abstract and also to increase pharmacy practice contribution to the global health. So this program will really offer an interactive and keynote session, networking the event, and also an interactive closing panel discussion. So book your place before this month and join us the uh, uh, practice research summer uh, meeting. Another uh, big event we, we have been waiting is the Civil uh, 80th FIP World Congress for Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Science, which will be in Civil between 18 and 22 September 2022. The theme Congress for this year is Pharmacy United and the Recovering of Healthcare. So um, we uh, register. Registration and abstract submission are already open. Open. So, if you want to have more information, please visit our website civil2022.fip.org. Um, our uh, congress this year has like mainly three topics. The, the first one is never waste a crisis and learning for future preparedness. Topic two is science and evidence supporting the response to COVID-19. And topic three is dealing with the new and extraordinary ethical challenges. So important dates. Abstract submission deadline was on June 5, 2022. I wish that you had submitted your abstracts to, to be considered for this civil congress. Uh, the results will be announced on the 1st of July, 2022. So the committee is now working on all the abstracts that were submitted. And the early bird registration deadline is July 15. So for more information, Go to the website, civil2022.fip.org, register, and we're all waiting you at Civil. Uh, Jehan and Jao, a final uh, word for our uh, uh, participants. Jehan? Yes, yes, sure. So uh, I would like to thank you, Marwan. I'd like to thank the FIP for giving us the chance to speak today. So again and again, constipation is a very common condition. And we as pharmacists, we can provide assistance to our patients. We can help them. We are knowledgeable. We are accessible healthcare professionals. We are in a unique position to help the patients who present with acute constipation by telling them about OTC medication to help them with the selection 
or if there is a necessity to refer them, to refer them to a physician if necessity. And as I mentioned in my presentation, the key message about the treatment option is that one size does not fit all. Constipation is actually a polysymptomatic heterogeneous disorder. No one treatment will work for everybody. So we have to be prepared for change. We have to be prepared for counseling. We have to be prepared to help our patients as we always do. Thank you again. Thank you, Jao. That's it. Uh, we play a pivotal role uh, in our communities. We keep being uh, an essential um, health professional in, in our communities. But to, to keep doing so, we have to keep updated. We have to base our, um, what we say, on science. Uh, we know that we in the pharmacy, we have this more um, easygoing contact with our patients that we have to keep in mind that in the first place, we are scientists. And now we have no excuses. There is webinars, there is guidelines available. So keep updated. And most of, or on top of this, I would suggest to our colleagues to use empathy too and to adapt these guidelines because we as pharmacists, we work as a translator. We translate these graphics and these um, strange names and these mechanisms of action into uh, something that is um, understandable by our, by our patients. So keep talking with other professionals, learn from the physicians, learn from the nurses, learn from the patients themselves and from all the colleagues and keep updated based on the, on the best uh, evidence. And thank you to the FIP for improving uh, our, our capacities, our skills through these webinars and to all of these participants that keep listening to us after one hour and something. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Allow me to add my thank you note to all the thank you notes that we are receiving from the participants. This was really a very interactive session, mm -hmm. very knowledgeable, and we're so happy that you were with us in this discussion. We want also to thank Dr. Ahmed for his uh, presentation and participation. For all the participants, uh, keep an eye or on our events and register on the uh, events that, F uh, the, that FIP is uh, offering. All webinars are very diversified. You can, you can find whatever you want and you can get the updates that you're looking for. We wish to see you on the big event that are coming, either the research event or the civil event. So till then, have, a nice, uh, have nice times and we'll see you uh, on our upcoming events. Bye-bye for now.